In the final part of the How to Think About Climate Change series, we talk about finding our way to solutions. Well, that's kind of important, right? So let's dive straight in. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. So let's be clear. The fossil fuel era was an incredible breakthrough for the human race. It marked the liberation from the point where most of us needed to spend all of our time securing our most basic needs, particularly food, to one where we could do other productive things. It was the breakthrough that made our complex, amazing, information-rich age even remotely possible. Now, we as a human society are taking the next step and moving towards the age of zero carbon energy. The majority of governments and citizens agree that this is necessary because of what we know about human-caused climate change. But even if you're one of those that doesn't or feels the jury's out, the value from reductions in air pollution and the impact on people's health, as well as geopolitical energy security and long-term energy supply, makes it a goal in principle that anyone could sign up to. But... There are dumb ways to go about it, and there are smart ways to go about it. We have an interest in avoiding the former and seeking out the latter. The way we tend to debate these solutions leaves much to be desired. Much the way that we debate about every other aspect of climate change. Here are some of my general thoughts about how to think about the solutions, and it brings together some of the approaches that we've touched on in previous videos in this series. Number one, there is a debate to be had. Oh yes, I know this is aggravating for some. There are no inevitable one-size-fits-all policies that become self-evidently the only solution once you decide to decarbonise. There are plenty of people who come up with the easy intuitive policies. Spoiler alert, easy intuitive policies often turn out not to be the right ones. And simply decide you have to support those policies or else you're a denier or whatever derogatory label is currency for this month. Countries have different governance and different advantages and disadvantages. Left and right, authoritarian, libertarian, technically advanced, producer of commodities. All these political traditions and practical circumstances will mean different preferences for how they approach policy. If you can't decarbonise the world unless the whole world follows one approach, then you can't decarbonise the world. And this is the point. You have to frame the problem you're solving properly. The protest movements will suggest to you that it's a single variable problem. The only requirement is to reduce carbon emissions to zero. No other factor carries any weight in deliberations except for the results in that. Focus on a single variable has never, in the course of history, been the mark of a successful policy. Not once. It has been tried. Mao decided that the absolute priority was steel production. People were pulled from the fields to run small-scale steel furnaces. They took every utensil, every cooking pot anybody owned in order to make it into steel. And the outcome was a bunch of extremely low-quality steel and approximately hmm, 40 million dead from an extended famine. Focus on a single variable is an act of the fanatic. I will go out on a limb here and say that fanaticism isn't going to get the job done. So, if it's not a single variable problem, i.e. get carbon emissions to zero, then what is the multivariable alternative? In other words, what's the exam question? It's this. Find ways for people and nations to meet their objectives and aspirations within the constraints of protecting the planet whose productivity is essential to make those objectives possible in the long term. Do so in spite of the fact humans are really bad at prioritising long-term objectives over short-term considerations. Do so in a way that makes us more resilient to external factors and will account for the multiple ways that we will mess up along the way. Now, you might think that sounds like it's hard work, much harder than the single variable problem. You're not wrong that it's a big challenge, but you are wrong about it being harder than the alternative. The single variable version is much harder because those other variables don't go away because you ignore them. Let me reframe the single variable objective as it really is. Find ways to reduce carbon emissions to zero in ways that make no concessions to the objectives and aspirations of nations and their people. Do so in spite of the fact that humans are really bad at prioritising long-term objectives over short-term considerations and so therefore will fight you all the way. 
Do so regardless of the fact that single-minded approaches will cause massive upheavals and exacerbate external factors. Do so by forcing all nations to do it your way and don't entertain any possibility you might make mistakes along the way. Does that sound like plain sailing? Nah, didn't think so. For my part, I'm completely agnostic about which are the best proposals. If there are seven possible things you could do about an issue and three of them would work but are very different to each other, well, I tend to the view we should take one of the ways that will work. Beyond that, I don't have that much of a preference. If society chooses the way that will work, that preserves maximum freedom, that's cool. If society chooses a way that will work, that preserves maximum safety, yeah, I'm good with that. I may develop a personal preference for one I think is the absolute best, but, you know, I'll be perfectly content if society decides its values don't align with mine in that instance. Many people, unfortunately, tend to intuitively believe that solutions that tend towards authoritarianism will be the most likely to work because it means they can sweep aside the tediously persistent critics quickly and thoroughly so that they can do what intuitively seems obvious. Such solutions more often fit into the doesn't work category. And what you're trying to do is to move it from the doesn't work category into the does work category by force. History shows that this is an illusion and things that won't work don't work, shockingly enough. And that doesn't change just because a dictator insists on it. Those arguments are worth fighting against with the utmost vigour. Number two. Assume all the people can contribute to being part of a solution and work on that basis. So, for example, take blame out of the equation. The solution to a complex problem like climate change doesn't centre on finding someone to blame and punishing them. The people that you might think are to blame for the problem are also to thank for the amazing prosperity and development that we've achieved. They have skills and experience that will be crucial in changing the design of our systems to meet the new objectives of the future. All you have to do is to persuade and recruit them, which is a lot easier than trying to destroy them. Once people accept that the agenda is that we're creating the new energy era, they will eventually be happy to be part of the effort, especially if they can continue to succeed in life by contributing. It's a broad generalisation, but if the incentives support the effort, people will follow the incentives by and large. If, on the other hand, you declare that they are the enemy and they must be destroyed, unsurprisingly and wholly justifiably, in my view, they're going to fight you all the way. Given the choice between fight or die, yeah, they're going to fight. It's as easy a choice as this one. Cake or death? Uh, cake, please. <laughs> Very well. Give him cake. Oh, thanks very much. It's very nice. You cake or death? Uh, cake for me too, please. Very well. Give him cake too. We're going to run out of cake at this rate. Of course, if you're going to trust people to be part of a solution, you're going to have to accept that what they come up with won't necessarily be the exact thing that you would have come up with. And maybe it won't be as good as what you would have come up with. That's just a fact in the art of delegation. Any manager could tell you how hard that is, especially the ones that give a damn about quality. And that brings us to the next point. Number three, forget utopia. The sustainable future will not be a constantly joyous place full of happy smiling people holding hands and dancing in a circle before breaking to eat organic food and count their blessings or whatever it is you think utopia looks like. Here's the bad news or the good news depending on your take. The sustainable world will be just as dirty, smelly, unfair, corrupt, capricious, ridiculous, exploitative and dumb as it is today. At the same time as being beautiful, loving, sexy, intellectually amazing, adventurous or inspiring and all of that other stuff. In other words, exactly like today, but sustainable. Human beings are incapable of producing a utopia. 
If you think you're designing a utopia, you're actually designing a system that cannot succeed because it will inevitably depend on people being how you want them to be or need them to be, not how they actually are. It's like the early computer networks that were designed by idealistic nerds who were then shocked and more than a little outraged when other smelly people rushed in to exploit the fact they hadn't thought it would be necessary to defend those systems against malicious internal attack. The US Constitution was crafted by smart people on the principle that for at least some of the time, the system would be run by idiots. And so the system needed to be robust enough to cope with the kind of destructive tendencies of idiots. Global sustainability is going to need to have some similar kind of robustness built in. And no, I have no idea what that looks like. I think we're going to be vulnerable to the actions of idiots for quite some time to come. Four. Understand what makes for good, enduring systems in practice. People follow incentives, so we're trying to design or tweak incentives so that people are rewarded for doing things in the right way. It's a lot harder to do than people think, because many times we actually end up creating perverse incentives to game the system. The history of this in environmental protection goes back a very long way. For example, one of the earliest environmental laws in England gave local authorities the responsibility to enforce action against river pollution. But the same authorities were often the biggest culprits creating that pollution. So surprise, surprise, the law didn't work. Only when property owners were empowered by law to prosecute those whose actions were damaging their property did you get the effective aligning of incentives to make the legislation work? This is why market forces have been so powerful, because millions of micro decisions based on self-interest turns out to be a great self-designing vehicle for the efficient creation of wealth. It's not great at dealing with the externalities it creates, such as pollution, and it's entirely agnostic about moral attitudes we might have to wastefulness. So the search is on for ways not to lose the benefits while introducing elements that will effectively deal with the downsides. Complex systems such as the early EU emissions trading scheme were never going to be very effective at doing that. It turns out bureaucrats design really bad market mechanisms. I know, shocker. People in this space tend to gravitate quickly towards big global initiatives that are intended to create an effective system based on essentially magical thinking. Now, nothing's impossible, but the history of innovation and societal progress tends to come more through the individual breakthroughs and innovations that come because smart people are encouraged to solve problems. People spend all their time focusing on what big policies governments should be putting into action, and nowhere near enough on the individual innovations that will enable us to move from the fossil fuel era successfully and prosperously to the zero carbon energy era. Because after all, that's how we moved into the Industrial Revolution in the first place. And that brings us to the final point. Note the huge number of ways you can make a personal contribution. See how many things are going on. Large numbers of companies have signed up to net zero and are actively working out how to make that a reality. Significant numbers of countries have committed to net zero with experts in all fields in those countries working on the implications for their field. The Farmers' Union is looking at how we keep food production high at zero carbon. Nuclear engineers are progressing fourth generation nuclear that solves the problems with the ancient old tech that makes up the current nuclear power plants. Scientists are producing genetically engineered variants of crops to be more resilient in an era of climate change. Entrepreneurs are looking at improving the performance of renewable energy or, like Elon Musk, bringing zero carbon energy to transport. Companies are experimenting with circular economy models. Decision makers are enabling solutions, finding approaches that will work. Diplomats are negotiating worldwide agreements on any of this, a job that will get a lot easier when technological breakthroughs create obviously desirable or at least achievable pathways to zero carbon solutions. Obviously, the line that nobody has done anything is not true. It's a propaganda line designed to fuel outrage and motivate activism. Maybe on that basis you support it. I would suggest it's better to motivate action on things that are true rather than things that aren't. There are literally millions of problem solvers and constructive change makers working on different aspects of this across the world. If you're minded to join them, there are lots of possible ways to make a difference. The question comes down really to where your skills and your passions lie, how much you believe in yourself and your own capacity to make a difference to the community and the world that you're a part of. 
Even if you don't do that, even if you want to focus primarily on the public policy debate, I hope you found this series useful and thought-provoking. The state of the debate right now is extremely stale, with two ideological factions with their approved range of positions jumping on any facts that support them, whilst ignoring and dismissing any that contradict them. It's not surprising. It's not new. I mean, there were lots of angry debates and fights when we moved originally into the Industrial Revolution. There were all sorts of hilarious quotes of important people, such as historian Edward Byrne, even as streets were seeing more efficient and reliable cars in 1900, writing, It is not probable that man will ever be able to get long without the horse. Those arguments got resolved because solutions came out that were so demonstrably useful. But it wasn't always obvious in advance what those were going to be. None of it gets solved by itself. We need good people to be involved, being creative, open-minded, pragmatic and solutions-oriented. Otherwise, we leave the ideologues in charge. And that's not going to get the job done at all.